Poltergeists are ghosts that seem to divide opinion. Many would agree that they exist as some sort of intelligence on the rampage, bringing fear and unrest to those who encounter such a force. But it is debatable whether these entities spring from those who are living or from those who are now deceased, who return to cause chaos in various ways. Either way, poltergeists often cause great distress to those who are involved in their strange activities. Bromley is a large town in southeast Greater London. Originally part of Kent, it became a chartered market town in 1158. H.G. Wells was born here in 1866, and a host of famous people have lived here over the years, including David Bowie, Enid Blyton, Alastair Crowley and Norman Cook. Many people have heard of the Enfield poltergeist that rose to fame in the late 1970s, and you may be familiar with the earlier case of the Battersea poltergeist from the 1950s, but few have heard of the Bromley poltergeist. This case, with its bizarre location, its persistence and its terrifying actions, is arguably one of the strangest poltergeist cases documented to this day. Three elderly men were at the centre of the events and were subjected to terrifying attacks so severe the Society for Psychical Research were called in to investigate. The Grove Park allotments, and in particular the two sheds owned by the Kentish Garden Guild that operated as a small shop for allotment owners, might seem an unusual location for a poltergeist, and you'd be right, but these curious events happened over a period of two years in the early 1970s. Alfred Taylor was a 78-year-old man who, like many, enjoyed an active retirement at the allotment. On Thursdays, he'd order gardening supplies, fertiliser, tools, seeds, etc. And on Sunday mornings, Taylor and his friends, Tony Elms and Clifford Dewis, opened their shop in the iron-roofed shed and would sell their items to fellow allotment owners. This had been commonplace for years, and the small enterprise was very popular. But on one quiet Sunday, in April 1973, this all changed. What occurred was entirely unexpected. The men were chatting in the shed when some powder stored in a bag suddenly hit the ceiling. Clifford Dewis's first thought was that some kids were up to no good. Perhaps they were the victims of some sort of prank. But then, and seemingly of its own accord, a small pewter jug on a shelf flew across the shed, narrowly missing Dewis's face. The men speculated that a youngster must have broken in and subjected them to a novel trick from the joke shop, and the jug was picked up and placed in a box with a lid. Within minutes, the jug was back on the floor in front of them, but the lid remained in place on the box. The men looked at each other and began to feel uneasy. For the next few weeks, a series of unexplainable events plagued the men, particularly Elms and Taylor. From a large bin of Gromore came a fountain of pellets that struck the ceiling and showered onto customers, scaring many of them senseless. A seven-pound weight flew off a set of scales and struck Alf Taylor on the shoulder. The men were completely puzzled and still believed they were the victims of a hoax, but when Taylor was struck on the head by an entire box of gardening utensils and needed medical help, it all felt rather sinister. All manner of objects seemed to move from their ordinary locations one after another. Taylor described the items going around the hut like skittles, but nobody ever saw them take off. Objects appeared to have a life of their own. Rumours began to circulate and customers became too afraid to visit. 
Bottles of weed killer and slug pellets were unscrewed and tipped all over the floor. Heavy bottles of liquid maxicrop fell like dominoes, their contents pouring out in front of the men. These incidents were proving to be extremely expensive and more than 45 kilos of fertiliser pellets were strewn onto the floor and saturated by the tipped liquid, making them unusable. But it seemed this entity wasn't finished and began to operate outside of the shed. Money was taken from one of their cars and the coins rained down on the men in the shed with alarming force. The men started to keep their coins in plastic bags, sellotaped inside their cars, but this didn't deter the malevolent force. Tony Elms, about to drink a coffee he made, discovered the coffee had been tipped out and replaced with fertiliser. The building would frequently shake. A customer was struck by a garden fork thrown in the style of a javelin, and another customer was struck by a seven-pound bag of fertiliser. On one occasion, the men, shaken and alarmed by the moving objects, closed the shop well before the usual time of one o'clock. Customers tried to support the men, but it was becoming increasingly hard. George Bentley, a regular customer and a friend, quoted, One time some money disappeared, and the next thing I knew, a ten pence coin fell into a cup of tea I was drinking. Another time, I went to the shed to buy a seven pound bag of Gromore. I asked for it and saw it lift off the shelf, float across and burst open on the counter. There were some right queer goings on and a lot of us saw them. Elms and Taylor knew something had to be done, but what? It was Elms who approached a local church for advice and subsequently he carried out a DIY exorcism on a Friday night, alone in the dark in one of the sheds. Onlookers heard tremendous banging sounds and feared the walls of the structure could collapse at any moment. The heavy door swung open nine times and eventually Elms emerged with a nasty cut on his head and an injured hand that became terribly bruised for weeks. On the next Saturday evening, the men returned to the shed to prepare for the following morning's sales. They unlocked the door to the shed and found it in complete chaos. The interior looked as if it had been hit by a bomb. The goods were off the shelves, some were airborne and circling the men by an unseen force. The sign of the cross appeared painted on and scratched into most exposed surfaces. The counter, the walls, the plastic tubs and the wooden benches. Two five foot six planks used to barricade the shed securely had disappeared and were found the following day outside of the shed in the shape of a cross. Even the drawing pins on the community notice board were arranged in the shape of a cross. Could this be the poltergeist consciously mocking the gentleman and Tony Elms' attempt to exorcise the spirit? The police were called, but there was no evidence of a forced entry. The malevolent spirit seemed to follow the men at times. Alfred Taylor suffered various attacks in his own home in front of family members, including being slapped across the face. He was pushed over in the Bromley Council offices. The energy of this force seemed to be escalating rather than subsiding. After suffering at the hands of the poltergeist for six months, the men were desperate for help. Alf Taylor rang the Society for Psychical Research, pleading for help, and the chairman, Manfred Kasserer, and his wife and fellow researcher, Pauline Reynolds, agreed to meet with Taylor at his home in Downham and accepted the offer to visit the site. What they witnessed assured them that this was not a hoax and the men were not making things up. After all, these dreadful events were losing them money. The researchers investigated the site on two occasions. The first was in October 1973, where both Cassera and Runnels witnessed the spirit in full force. 
They watched as security bolts from a window disappeared and were found in a car outside. In front of their eyes, they witnessed Tony Elms being attacked by a saw that ran down his back and ripped his shirt. They experienced frantic banging on the walls of the shed that was so extreme they thought their lives were in danger. The number 1659 mysteriously appeared on a wooden panel in front of their eyes. Initially they thought it was written in blood, but it was actually maxi crop. Other writing and scribbles became visible, large question marks, various letters from the English alphabet, and strangely, the name of one of Taylor's dead friends, who had no connection with the allotment, appeared on a wall. The second visit took place in June 1974, and on this occasion, as they opened the door to the shed, a human face was visible on the counter, constructed like a mosaic from various pellets and chemicals in the shed. White sulphite was used to create a skull, and the eyes, nose and mouth were formed using brown maxi crop. The men were haunted by this image, but all agreed that it had been created with great skill and precision. The pensioners all felt that they lacked the dexterity and patience to create something so intricate. By the end of the day, the face simply disintegrated and faded away. The researchers witnessed objects moving by their own accord. A metal watering can flew across the shed. A large canister of ant killer fell off a shelf and was put back three times. Wooden planks were pushed over, and the impression of a child's hand in white powder appeared above a shelf and then morphed into a face. A brass paperweight engraved with the letters MN appeared on the floor, but none of the men had ever seen it before, and nobody knew what MN could symbolise. Car keys disappeared from Elms's coat pocket and were found in the researcher's bag. Taylor's thermos flask vanished and reappeared in a carrier bag on the back of Jewess's motorbike. Four pounds of petty cash disappeared from a locked cash box. A garden fork flew across the shed again, and more fertiliser appeared, this time in the thermos flask, instead of coffee. Elms was pushed in the back so hard he hurt his neck and collided into Cassera, who had a bulb thrown at him with great force. Neither of the researchers had ever witnessed such bizarre activity firsthand. The researchers documented their findings, but were unable to stop the chaos of the Bromley poltergeist. But only a few months later, all the activity ceased, just as quickly as it began. Fellow gardener George Bentley said, it all stopped after the work on a new block of garages was finished. Nobody knows why the activity stopped so suddenly, or why it began in the first place. And why did the activity focus so much on Tony Elms, a man in his 70s, making the most of his retirement? Was there something in his subconscious or personality, some sort of hidden anger or bitter resentment? Tony Elms didn't think so. This wicked, insanely childlike entity distressed and disturbed all of the men who fortunately were able to return to the quiet enjoyment of their allotment until the end of their days. I thought this was a really interesting case with so many awful incidents and it's really not a haunting that's terribly well known. Unlike the Enfield poltergeist, for example, in the late 1970s that was covered extensively in the press, in the Mirror newspaper in particular, I don't think I found any press coverage of this haunting at all. I did try and look into the land and I did discover that Grove Park allotments are part of what was an 18th century um, garden belonging to a physician called Dr John Letsom. And he was an important physician and philanthropist who had a house here for about 20 years, but it was demolished in 1800. And what stood there before, I don't know. These are just my opinions, but in a way I think these rather extreme events appear to be quite credible as I don't really understand why a group of pensioners would be motivated to make something like this up, especially as they lost money throughout the period and were subjected to really quite extreme injuries. 
Most of the pensioners that I know really fear becoming ill or injured, and cuts in particular can lead to infections, and that could mean hospital and possibly a rapid decline. Also, the soft tissue on elderly folks can be very thin, it doesn't heal terribly well, and it can be a real problem, so I don't see why you would inflict such an injury on yourself. I suspect the cleaning up of all the tipped products would be a very arduous task that none of them would relish at all when they would rather be gardening. And you might risk a strain, end up with backache, your respiratory health might struggle with it. And I know I'm going to sound like I'm stereotyping here, but in the early 1970s, lots of elderly people were quite heavy smokers and it really wasn't uncommon. Another component with this story is that you've got the sheer number of witnesses. There's the three men, of course, Tony Elms, Alfred Taylor and Clifford Dewis. Then there's the witness, George Bentley, and, of course, the two researchers who had to publish their findings for the Society of Psychical Research, which they did. Cassera and co-investigator Pauline Runnels both said that there was no evidence of deception or hoax in their published research. A point to consider here is that if the researchers had made up an account of what they'd witnessed, it would bring the name of the Society for Psychical Research into disrepute, an organisation that formed in 1882, as well as their own credibility as researchers. If you take the Enfield poltergeist, for example, John Beloff and Anita Gregory, both senior figures at the Society for Psychical Research, concluded that the family were involved in playing some tricks and weren't afraid to say this publicly. I'll talk a bit more about the Society for Psychical Research in a bit as I've got a bit of news on that front. These are just my thoughts and I'd love to know what you think about this case, but I thought we'd have a little look at what some experts believe about poltergeists. And firstly, I'm going to start with well-known sceptic Dr Kieran O'Keefe from Buckinghamshire New University, who states... Parapsychologists like to differentiate between hauntings and poltergeists. Hauntings are traditionally location-focused, whereas poltergeists are traditionally person-focused. The other difference is that hauntings can go on for many years, decades or even centuries, whereas poltergeists are traditionally very short-term, so they may only be a few weeks, months and, in rare cases, leading up to a year or longer. We know that in periods of turmoil there can be an increase in the number of cases. A classic case would be in the 1930s, prior to the Second World War, we saw an increase in cases. Now, is this because people are literally being haunted by a poltergeist? Or is it because they are processing that emotional turmoil in some way and interpreting the phenomena as being paranormal? The late Peter Underwood, who was president of the Ghost Club Society and a prominent member of the Society of Psychical Research, and he investigated numerous cases of hauntings and phenomena, wrote the following... Poltergeist, what images the word conjures up? Strange sounds, strange happenings, strange people, almost a world apart. And yet this extraordinary activity happens every day, somewhere, to some puzzled individuals. I have seen objects move when no human person has been near them. I have felt the heat of propelled objects that have suddenly appeared from nowhere. I have heard strange voices issue from children, even sleeping children and I have seen the incredible results of so-called poltergeist activity. Believer and parapsychologist Evelyn Hollow says the following, We tend to find that poltergeists tend to latch themselves onto someone and really wear them down, like the paranormal equivalent of a psychotic, obsessive ex. There are a couple of different versions of categorisation of poltergeists. The one I devised has seven stages. Stage one is a presence, so a feeling that you're having in your house or location. Stage two is noises. Stage three is moving objects. Stage four is apporting and disapporting, which is when an object appears suddenly and resolutely in a physical space, and disapporting is the opposite. Stage five is destruction. We go to places being smashed up, things being damaged. Stage six can sometimes involve communication. Stage seven is threat to life, We see this in very few cases, but we are in the realm of bodily harm. Well, I think the Bromley poltergeist pretty much covers most of those things when you think about it, including threat to life. If you've got people being um, attacked with a saw or a fork being thrown at them, I mean, those objects could do serious injury to somebody. 
if it isn't an actual poltergeist, um, what could it actually be? I suppose some people would say it's a hoax. Some people could say it's hallucinations. Maybe it's seismic activity or if there's water turbulence under the property. I did wonder if any of the men were on medicines. And if you've got a person who has a lot of medicines to take and they've taken it, them incorrectly, or maybe it's a side effect, could they have um, hallucinations or violent behaviour as a result? These are just ideas, really. I did contact the Society for Psychical Research by email about this case, and I asked if it was possible to see any notes from the investigations or any documents relating to the case, that sort of thing. And within hours, I got a very nice email back from the secretary, who wrote that he will look into it when he goes back into the office on the 10th of January. So fingers crossed, maybe, maybe we'll be able to see some interesting notes or something like that, perhaps. I'll update you if I hear anything. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and there's loads more to come, including more poltergeist cases. Please feel free to comment below as to what you think happened at Bromley. Is it a poltergeist? Do you think it's something else? I'd be fascinated to hear your opinions. Take care guys and I'll see you on the next video. Please remember to like and subscribe.